Well, it's one of the big talking subjects, isn't it, at the moment, about what about getting more people to the Isle of Man. And we see these large vessels going past, and we hear about the Orkneys and what they're doing in gathering more people to come. In fact, every day you hear about a new cruise liner being launched. They've got to go somewhere. So that's where we talk about now, the Isle of Man. Should we have one of these super areas where you can dock these big boats, 5,000 people or more, coming into the island? Well, Dr. Klein is joining us from Newfoundland, and he's an expert on this. Uh, you're the sort of cruise junkie, I think, is the terminology that's being used for you. And you'll be presenting here on Monday for PAG to talk about this. And interestingly, you're not saying this is a good idea necessarily to have 5,000 people landing and, and taking part in, in uh, looking around the Isle of Man and then going off on their merry way, are you? Well, what I'm saying is that you've got to look at both the what, what appear to be the positives as well as the things that may not be so positive. So I'm not arguing against the idea of, of uh, expanding cruise tourism, but trying to present uh, words of caution, kind of uh, because once you've made the commitment, once you have it, it's hard to hard to scale it back. And I think it's thinking about, is the community realistic about the kind of money that can be made from cruise tourism? Uh, is, is it realistic in terms of what the costs are of, of having cruise ships, not just the cost of construction of a pier, but things like maintenance, uh, infrastructure costs, uh, uh, and, and, and other kinds of things that become hidden until you, until you begin to start looking. In, in certain countries, there's been demonstrations. In fact, Venice, uh, I was there myself on a cruise, but, but two weeks earlier, there'd been uh, sort of an outcrying from the locals that it's completely killing the, the, the place of Venice, you know, a city of Venice, because the yeah, well, tourists it, turn up and then they go it, off at the end of the day, they don't spend much money. Exactly. In Venice, there's two issues. One is is the, the damage to the, the infrastructure of buildings by the size of the ships. Uh, so in a sense, the environmental impact. The other is what I would refer to as people pollution, the, the effect of having huge numbers of people offloading into the city for, you know, for, for six, seven, eight hours in a day, uh, probably spending little more than what you would buy for postcards and souvenirs and then leaving again. And I think that becomes one of the risks is not do you increase the, the size of cruise tourism, but what size of cruise tourism do you want? What's reasonable? that's consistent with your current type of tourism product. For example, Key West had found that cruise tourism there grew to the point where it began to displace the traditional visitors, that the people who came down and stayed at hotels for five days or for a week weren't coming down anymore because the cruise passengers were just, there were just too many for them to enjoy what was there to be had. Like, so I think it's... yeah. An example would be like, yeah, instance, we have steam trains, we have this sort of infrastructure. If you had 5,000 people turning off a boat, that would completely clog the system up and other, local, other tourists wouldn't be able to get usage of that. Is, is that the sort of thing you're talking about, just over usage when you've got so many people arriving very quickly? Well, certainly that, that the numbers of people become a, become a, a huge problem. The other part is I'll, I'll talk about the differences in cruise ships because not all cruise ships are the same. Uh, those 5,000 passenger cruise ships have a different type of passenger than some of the smaller ships, some of the ships that may be 1,000 passengers or, or maybe 500 passengers. And that's part of thinking consciously about, well, what do we want our cruise tourism to look like? Do we want to cater to the, the largest of the, of the mass market and just become another one of those kind of homogenized cruise ports? Or do we want to try to become something that's unique, something that's different, that caters to just a segment of the cruise market? And that becomes a local decision. OK. Is it positives? I mean, at the end of the day, it sounds like it's bringing money in at some description. And we, we, we do not yet have many boats coming. I mean, we get more each year, but compared with other places, I mean, the Orkneys being one of them, of course, with a deep uh, berth and, and Guernsey. Um, should the Isle of Man be doing more or, or do you think it is take care, be cautious? Well, I, I think it's a local decision and I think it's a matter of taking in all of the information and thinking realistically. Uh, often the the numbers that are thrown around how much, how much passenger, cruise passengers spend are overly inflated and don't, don't take into account what are called leakages, the kinds of the money that doesn't end up on shore. So thinking concretely about, I mean, it's a business. Are we going to, are we going to make money from this or is it going to disrupt other parts of our business? 
Okay, well, you're here on Monday with the PAG meeting and uh, obviously lots more on this. It's a fascinating subject because I think a lot of people just assume it's a great idea. Now you're putting a sort of a, a little bit of a warning shot across that uh, don't necessarily get what you wish for. Yeah, and, and it'll be great to have a dialogue because I'm sure people have their views and certainly there'll be an opportunity for discussion and exchange. It's, uh, so I think it'll be a, a, a great evening for, for, for both uh, kind of getting new information but also exchanging ideas. And do, do you think £60 million pounds is, is that sort of money you know, well spent? If you're going to do it, that's a, that would do it enough to bring those large ships to us? Well, I, th I think that's a it's a huge undertaking. That that's a lot of money to spend, which means a lot of opportunity cost. So what's being foregone when that's being spent? But I think probably the bigger issue is once that's spent, what ships can come there, how many can come there, and what are going to be the maintenance costs? Because once it's built, it still needs maintenance. And uh, are people thinking about? You know, let's say uh, you know five million, a, five million a year or more for maintenance. It's uh, uh, it's not just you pay for it and all of a sudden all this money is going to start rolling in. And we're going to be impacted here with the Liverpool uh, docks area. Obviously, they're going for a, a mega big uh, reconstruction there and bringing in the super boats and the Isle of Man vessels are being shoved further further down the Mersey. I mean, they obviously have done their homework. You'd have thought and think this is what we all want to do. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you need to have, for that kind of investment, you need to have a certain amount of anticipated income and income that you can rely on. Uh, uh, very often, ports have this idea that if you build it, they will come, and they, they've, built, they've built ports, and they're sitting there with investments of $24, $30 million, and uh, they're seeing no return on that because no ships are coming. But there is a scramble, isn't there, almost worldwide now. Everyone's seeing that there's this golden money sitting out there floating around and they want it. Everyone's competing for it. And of course, as a result, as business works, the cruise industry is able to play ports against each other. So, you know, they'll say, because I think already, uh, uh, the, you know, Isle of Man is being compared to the Orkneys, to Guernsey, to some other places. And each of those is unique places. Uh, the other issue becomes someplace like Guernsey, I know, uh, uh, they have a number of ships that they plan to get that just are prevented from, by, prevented from coming because of weather. Um, so even if you have a commitment or you have it on the calendar that, that a certain number of ships are going to be there, um, that doesn't mean that's the number of ships that will actually show up, um, and which has an impact for planning and it has an impact for income. And on that, I mean, in the Isle of Man, the larger ships can't obviously get in. They use their tenders. It's well known, isn't it, that a lot of people are put off by the very fact that they're going to have to get a boat from the big ship into port. And likewise, uh, many times in the past, I think the whole day has been cancelled if the weather is really rough. And that can really also cause terrible disruption to people who have planned their day and, and set aside you know, the, the tourist places for these people to visit. Oh, yeah, most definitely, though the same weather conditions can uh, prevent a ship from, it, from being able to dock as well. So, I mean, I think the Isle of Man, I, I live, on, I live uh, on the east side of an island, uh, you know, wet, weather comes up and it, it isn't a matter of docking or not, it's a matter of whether ships can actually, you know, set, safely get to the island. Um, I think one has to build that in, that a certain percentage of ships just aren't going to show up for whatever reason. Okay, fascinating to talk to you. And uh, as I say, to hear the both sides of this argument will be interesting. If people want to go along, it's Monday night, the usual place, of course, uh, the Manx Legion Hall in Douglas. 7.30, it's open to everyone, and you will be there, sir. Oh, definitely, for sure. Looking forward to it. Bye.